Okay, well, it's good to be back again this afternoon. I appreciate you folks allowing my wife and I to hang out with you today. I, I've enjoyed it, amen. Enjoyed the service this morning. And uh, some of you did, you came back, amen. What a blessing. Pray the Lord to help us again this evening. Enjoyed the evening of fellowship with your pastor and his wife and family. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Have your Bible this evening. Turn with us to Genesis chapter 45, if you will. Genesis chapter 45. <clears throat> Do things just a, a little bit different this evening. I, I hope the message will be a blessing to you and a help to you. I want to pray before I even begin. Then I'll share a couple of uh, things with you to bring you up to date as far as where we are in the Scripture. And then we'll just jump right in and, and read some verses. We'll make comment about them. As we go, begin in verse number 1, and I actually probably want to preach from about verse 14 and 15 when we get down to there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Thank you for these good folk, these good people. What a great blessing that they have been to my wife and I. And I pray, Lord, you'd help me to be a blessing to them. I pray that you would help us to remember things that we have studied and, and uh, things that we have put down, things we've thought about. God, would you bring to our remembrance these things and help us to preach this evening. And Lord, encourage and help your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In chapter 45, Joseph is going to reveal himself to his brethren. Joseph, of course, as you know, was sold into slavery in chapter number 37. And he has been in Egypt for some time now. When we get to chapter 45, of course, he's second in command or the prime minister, whatever, you want, whatever kind of title you want to give him. But anyway, he is um, in charge in a, in a serious time, a desperate time. There has been seven years of plenty, and now there are seven years of famine, and they're in the second year of that seven years of famine. And uh, Joseph's brethren have already made one trip down to Egypt, and there was a requirement for them when they came back. They come to get corn. They were, uh, because the famine was so severe, and they have came a second time. Joseph told them there was no need for them to come back if they did not bring Benjamin. And so the second trip, with much uh, regret from Jacob, he was finally allowed to bring Benjamin on the trip. And as they were leaving Egypt, Joseph had his silver cup placed into Benjamin's saddlebags or backpack, whatever it was he was carrying the corn in. And, uh, of course, he set him up that they might, he might reveal himself to his brethren. Something very interesting happened at the end of chapter number 44. Uh, Judah is the very one who was the ringleader of having Joseph sl uh, sold into slavery way back in chapter 37. And I mentioned Judah just a little bit this morning from chapter 38. But like all of us have the ability through the Lord, if we want to, we can change. And Judah has certainly changed by the time we get to chapter 44. And he's interceding on the behalf of his brother. He has promised his father that he would, he would stand good for him. And at the end of chapter 44, we see Judah pleading with Joseph to let Benjamin return. And he would stay in his stead. He would take his place. I certainly am glad the Lord Jesus Christ took my place and died for my sin. Joseph said, or, or Judah said, I'll take Benjamin's place. You let him return to his father. I'll stay here. I'll be your servant. I'll be your slave. I'll be whatever you want me to be. Just let him go free. Well, we begin in chapter 45, and I want to look at these verses, and I'll just make brief comments about them as we go. Verse number 40, or chapter 45, verse number 1, the Bible says, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by, and he cried, Calls every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So Joseph had all the people of Egypt to, to go out from his presence. He wanted to be alone with his brethren. He wanted to make himself. It's, it's an amazing thing. This is their second trip now down to Egypt, and they do not recognize Joseph. They don't know who he is. He's been able to conceal his identity from them. And uh, he's now come to the place where I believe that he sees not only in Judah, but maybe even in the other brethren that they have changed. They're really, 
Uh, they're really wanting or repentant to, because of what they have done and how they have, how they have treated him. And I, I'll tell you, a lot of times problems, famine, will drive you to a, a place in your life. I, there's a song a guy at our church sings sometimes about the bottom of the barrel. And sometimes when you get to the bottom of the barrel, the Lord's the only hope you have. And, and I don't mean that as a bad thing. He's the only hope we need. And so these, these brethren, maybe they're at that point. And so Joseph now is ready to let them know who he is. In verse number two, he says, And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. Verse number three, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Joseph here, you have to think of this picture. He has been away from them for a number of years now. He was 17 years old when they sold him into slavery. He was 30 years old when Pharaoh placed him in a position of authority. Seven years of plenty has already passed. Verse number six will tell us that they're in the second year of the famine. So Joseph is at least 39 years old. He's been 22 years removed from his family. And here he is, the, his brethren are standing before him and they think they're guilty of a crime. Joseph had planted the silver cup in the saddlebag and, and uh, they, they are unaware of that. They think that they're guilty of, of stealing from him and they're, they're standing before the prime minister and he's weeping. I can't imagine the thought upon their heart as they're standing behind or in front of the man who has the authority to sentence to them any punishment that he so desires. And he is standing there in this position of authority and he's weeping. And then the Bible says in verse number three, he said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. I don't know, I, I, in your mind, I hope you will be able to, to draw some kind of picture of how this must have been. Here they stand guilty. And if no one else in all the world knows that they're guilty, they know they're guilty. And Joseph reveals himself unto them. And I like what the Bible says next, and his brethren could not answer him. As you very well know, Joseph in the Bible, most likely the greatest type in typology or, or pictures, the greatest type of Christ in, in, in the Old Testament, Joseph is. And he, the, his brethren are standing before him guilty. He reveals himself to them and they have no answer. They don't have anything to say. I want to say this this evening before I move on. If you're here tonight, and uh, maybe for uh, your loss, maybe you're not saved, I, I don't know. And, and uh, I, I've talked to people before, not necessarily in church, but on the street and other things and visitation. And they have all of these ideas, things that they're going to tell God when they stand before him. The excuses that they're going to make. And, and what they're, listen friend, you die lost without God. You will stand before him guilty. And when he makes known unto you who he is, you will not have an answer. You'll not have an excuse. You may be bold in your excuse making now, but I promise you, Tara will grip your heart just like it gripped their heart. They understood their guilt. They understood their situation. They knew that they were to blame. They knew that they were guilty. And for the first time in their life, or the first time since they've been in this situation, they recognize who Joseph is, and they don't have anything to say. You die without Jesus Christ, you stand before God, you'll not have anything to say to him either. The, ver the Bible goes on, for they, it says, for they were troubled at his presence. Boy, I bet they were. Verse number four, and Joseph said unto his brethren, I thought about this, I was preaching on come this morning. He said, come near to me. Well, ain't that a blessing? Here they are, they're guilty. I came to God guilty. I stood before him guilty. I stood before him condemned. And yet he said, come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. His brethren are standing before him guilty. And he says, come near me, I pray thee. And they came near. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now in these verses four through eight, we're just going to read them. I'll try not to make many comments at all. But in verses 4 through 8, Joseph is seeking to reassure his brothers by pointing out God's purpose 
and his life to them. And he says, and Joseph said that uh, unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and there are five, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So we see in these verses of scripture, we see God working in his life. And also I believe that Joseph is some way trying to show them that because of the way that God has orchestrated his life, He's not bitter towards them. He's not angry towards them. He's showing them that, that God is working through him to do something to benefit them. And he understands that, and because of that, he is not bitter. God has taken their evil intentions and used it in Joseph's life to be a blessing to someone else. Well, that's isn't that amazing how God can use any situation and any circumstance in anybody's life and get glory out of it. What a blessing. Now, in the next verses, <clears throat> verses 9 uh, through 13, the Bible says this, Haste ye, and go up to my father and say to him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. I, I've often wondered why Joseph was so intent on having Benjamin to come to Egypt. I believe one of the reasons is, is, is revealed to us in verse number 12. I believe that I don't think Joseph or Jacob trusted his sons very well. And he said, if I can get Benjamin down here and Benjamin can see me with his own eyes and know that I am, that I am Joseph, when he goes back and tells his father, he'll believe, if he doesn't believe any of the other brethren, I think he'll believe Benjamin. And so he said in verse number 12, he said, And behold, your eyes see in the eyes of my brother Benjamin that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. Then verse number 13, And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that ye have seen, and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. The famine, they're only in, two years into the famine and there's five more years to come. And Joseph understands that the famine's going to be so severe that his father and his family is not going to make it if they don't come down to Goshen, come down to Egypt, so that he can take care of them. I'll tell you something. If you don't come to Jesus, you won't make it. Amen. If you don't come to Jesus, there, you have no hope of surviving. He's our only hope. Now, verse number 14 and verse number 15 are surely some of the most tender scenes in all of Scripture. Verse number 14, you have to think about this here. Joseph is, he's weeping, according to verse number 1. He has, he has revealed himself to his brethren. He has made known unto them his intentions. I, I want you to go back to, to my father's house. I want you to tell him that I'm in, I'm in command here. I'm in charge here. I am like a father to Pharaoh. You, there's five more years of this famine and you're not going to make it if you stay there. I want you to come. I want you to go get Jacob and bring him and all the people down into Egypt. And in verse number 14, the Bible says that he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. This is a great 
picture here in the Bible. Now listen, Benjamin had no, he had no involvement in selling Joseph into slavery. Benjamin was not with his brothers when Joseph went out into the field to greet his brothers that day. He had no part in him being in the place that he's in or in the situation that he's been in and the trouble that he's been through. I believe Joseph wanted to see Benjamin because that's, first of all, that's his full brother. And uh, he, he loves him and he, he wanted to, to be together with him again. And so it's a, it's a glad reunion. It's a brother that I haven't seen for 20 some years and I've been absent from him more than I was ever with him. And here he is face to face and we're together. And so he embraces him and, and uh, it, it's a grand reunion day. Now that's, that's one thing and that's wonderful. But I want you to look at the next verse. Moreover, Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with them. It's one thing to be glad to be reunited with someone that you love. And to be reunited with someone who has not done you any harm or done you wrong or, or caused you any trouble. But the Bible says in verse number 15, Moreover, he kissed all of his brethren and wept upon their neck. What a, Joseph is a great model of forgiveness. Here are a group of men who deserve judgment. Here are a group of men, unlike you and I, who deserve the wrath of the king. They, they deserve everything that Joseph has in his power to inflict upon them. They deserve it and more so for what they've done to him in his life. But instead of judgment, friend, he places his arm around them and he leans upon them and he weeps upon their neck and he kisses them in forgiveness, friend. Amen. Amen. I sure am glad that Jesus Christ forgave me. Deserving of judgment, deserving of punishment, deserving of the wrath of God, deserving of, the, of all the um, punishment that it could be meted out. I was guilty and deserved all of it. But in spite of that, when I came to Jesus, he put his arm around me and he wept upon my neck and he kissed me, friend. Welcomed me into the family. What a great reunion. Here's what I want to preach for these two verses. The introduction was probably as long as the message. We, we oftentimes make forgiveness very difficult. And we do that by false assumptions. I think sometimes we do that by not understanding the meaning of forgiveness. And I want for just a few moments... I want to tell you four things from this passage of Scripture that forgiveness is not. Four things that forgiveness is not. First of all, forgiveness is not overlooking the wrong. You can't, if somebody has done something towards you or against you, overlooking what they've done is not forgiveness. You see, Joseph pointed out, he pointed out to them twice in this chapter already that we've read, and some other places we'll mention in just a moment. He pointed out that they had done him wrong. He, look at the end of verse number four. Ye sold into Egypt. I, I'm your, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Then the very next verse, verse number five, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. Joseph didn't overlook the wrong. He did not pretend that nothing ever happened. In fact, he pointed it out to them more than once that you done me wrong. You sold me hither. And in spite of that, I can still forgive you. What a blessing. He did not minimize their wrong. He, he didn't um, make excuses. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times, well, I won't say we, I'll say me. Somebody will come and they have a grievance against somebody and, and uh, you know, somebody has said something, somebody has done something and, and I don't know, maybe I'm wrong or carnal, but the natural instinct is, well, you know, brother, maybe they didn't mean that. You know, 
you know, you, you begin minimizing the situation. Maybe, and, and, and oftentimes people take things wrong and what was said wasn't even said or meant to begin with. But in this situation, these brothers are guilty. They are guilty and they know they're guilty, but Joseph is not overlooking it. He is not minimizing the situation. He said, you sold me there. You sent me there. So forgiveness is not overlooking the wrong. In fact, Joseph said, in, he said it again in chapter number 50, verse number 20. He said, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. So first of all, forgiveness is not overlooking the wrong. Second of all, forgiveness is not excusing the wrong. Forgiveness is not excusing the wrong. You see, if you excuse somebody, it's because they weren't, it wasn't intentional or maybe I should say it wasn't intended or, uh, well, that's the same thing, duh. If you, if you excuse somebody, it's because there was, there was no, there, they wasn't, I, let me just give you an example, that'd be better. Several months ago, I went with my wife and her family. We all went on vacation together. Her dad has stage four cancer. He's taking chemo treatments. He wanted us all to go on vacation. So my wife and my children, my grandchildren, and her brother, his children, sister and her children. And we're in a restaurant eating on vacation. We was all sitting at a big table. And uh, this lady was cleaning the tables and she, was, she didn't have a, a cart with a tray that she's putting everything in. She was just stacking things up and carrying them. But she was coming through the restaurant. She tripped and fell. I felt so sorry for her. And when she did, obviously those dishes went everywhere. And it got all over my father-in-law and my sister-in-law. They didn't forgive her. They excused her. There wasn't anything to forgive. There wasn't, she didn't throw in dishes at them. She failed. I, I felt sorry for her. We, in fact, we never even seen her again. She had food all over her as well. We never even seen her again the rest of the time we was in the restaurant. I don't know if she went home or what. But forgiveness is not excusing the wrong. You don't, you don't make an excuse for the situation. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is holding someone accountable for their action, for what they have done. And while you're holding them accountable for what they've done, you still have the ability to forgive. Jesus held me accountable for my sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And while holding me accountable that for sin, he has the ability to forgive that sin. So forgiveness is not excusing the wrong. Forgiveness is not overlooking the wrong. Here's the one that helped me the most. Forgiveness is not forgetting. I, I was taught, and I'm sure by well-intended people, but I was taught that you forgive and forget. Well, friend, we don't have that capability. We, we're not able to do that. Only, only the Lord has the ability to forgive and forget. The Bible says, he, he said in the book of Hebrews chapter number 8 and also uh, Hebrews chapter 10, I believe it's 8, 12, 10, 17. Uh, he, he said, thy, thy sins and thine iniquities will I remember no more. And so he has the ability to forget, but you and I don't have the ability to forget. You say, Pretty, I, don't, I don't believe that. I believe if you actually forgive somebody, you forget. How long has Joseph has been in Egypt for 22 years. The largest portion of his life that he's lived has all been a direct result of something that somebody did to him that he did not deserve. There's no way he can forget that. He'll never, be, he'll never forget his brethren, his own flesh and blood, throwing him into a pit out there in the field that day and then selling him off to those Ishmaelite merchant men and they marched him down to Egypt and sold him into slavery. There's no way you can forget anything like that. Then him working in Potiphar's house and laboring in Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife falsely accusing him and they threw him into prison like a common criminal. There's no way he can forget that. Friend, you're not going to be able to forget it when people do you wrong either. I mentioned this morning, I've, I've been in church the largest majority of my life, the largest portion of my life. And I want to tell you something, as a, as a church member, 
And as a Christian, here's one thing you're going to have to get in your heart, and that's the ability to forgive. I mean, you're going to have to forgive when the other person is wrong and, they're, and it's clear that they're wrong and they've done you wrong like they did Joseph, Joseph and yet you're able to forgive them. And the fact that you can never get it out of your mind, you still have to be able to forgive them and to love them. Joseph fell on their neck and they wept together and he kissed them and he fellowshiped with them in spite of how they had treated them in his life greatest thing that you'll ever learn to do and it's not easy it takes the grace of God it takes the help of God it takes seeking God and praying and trusting God but the greatest thing you'll ever learn to do is forgive when someone else is guilty and you still forgive them and you still love them amen forgiving is not forgetting you never will be able to forget pastoring now for 17 years this, this, this month, October I was able I think it was the first Sunday in October 15 years God allowed me to pastor and I could tell you all kind of sad stories down through the years but I'd rather tell you all the good ones I'd rather, t listen, I don't, and, and the Lord knows my heart tonight, whether you do or not, and whether you believe me or not, the Lord does. I don't, I don't have any awe in my heart, any hatred, any anger towards any of those men that have done me wrong in any way, form, or fashion. I still pray for them. They're still on my prayer list. I still speak to them when I see them in public. They still oftentimes even call me for advice. I have, I have no sad stories to tell you. All that I want to tell you is that you can remember and you can still forgive if it's in your heart to do so. So forgiveness is not overlooking the wrong. Forgiveness is not excusing the wrong. Forgiveness is not forgetting the wrong. And there's a fourth one. Forgiveness is not taking blame for the wrong. A lot of times what we do is to minimize the situation. We'll begin to say, well, maybe I should have done this differently. And, and I'm not saying that I've always, I'm, I'm sure there's been... Many times when I should have done things different, I could have done things better. I, I know that. And I'm harder on myself than, than I am anybody else. But you can't take the blame for what somebody else did. That's not forgiveness. You know, Joseph could have said, well, you know, it, it was my fault anyway. I shouldn't have wore that coat that daddy made me. I, I know I was his favorite. Maybe I shouldn't have wore that coat out to the field that day. It was the wrong thing to do. I should not have done it. No. It was a coat that his dad made in love and a coat that his dad gave him and a coat that he had every right to be proud of and a coat that belonged to him and he had the ability to wear it anywhere that he wanted to and he didn't have to make excuse for doing that. He, he, he could have told his brother, you know what, those dreams that I had, even though those dreams were about you and those dreams concerned you, maybe I should have just kept those dreams to myself. Maybe I, I'd have been better off. Everything would have went if I'd have just kept that to myself and not said anything about it. No, friend. You can't make excuse. That's not forgiving. He pointed, right, I believe he looked right at me. He said, you sold me into slavery. You did this thing to me. In spite of that, I forgive you. I think oftentimes, I help you young people for just a minute. What a blessing. So many young people in the church. Oftentimes young couples get married. And, and I'll tell you, I've been married for 28 years. I'm probably the happiest married man in the world. I have no sad tales to tell you about marriage. I'm going to tell you the first years of our married life was rough. I mean, as soon as that honeymoon's over, you got two ways, and you're going to have to take those two ways and make one. And it's not easy, and it doesn't happen overnight. And there's going to be a lot of forgiving. You understand? And you, when you need to forgive somebody, when somebody does something wrong, I'm thinking about a situation right now that, 
that's heartbreaking, and I, I won't get into all that, but, but when, when one person in the relationship makes a, a, does something horribly wrong and, and they even admit that they've done that wrong, the other individual can't take the blame for his wrong or, 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 or he can't take the blame for her wrong. That doesn't work. That's not forgiven. You know, that, that's kind of, it's trying to put the problem under the shelf and hide it. And friend, when you do that, when you, when you do that, that thing festers and it gets bigger and the bitterness begins to grow in your heart and, and the anger builds up and there's going to come a day that that's going to come to a head and it's going to explode. So forgiveness, friend, is not taking the blame for someone else's wrong. It's being able to point it out and to stand by it and in your heart in spite of it still forgive them for what they've done. God to help your church. God to help you as individuals. When you get to the place in your life that you can forgive when you've been done wrong. Now, I want to look at, uh, tell you a couple of things. I'll look at one more thing and I'll be done. Forgiveness is a decision to bring pain to an end. Forgiveness is a decision to bring pain to an end. In order to forgive, I must let go of my resentment, my bitterness, my hurt, and my pride. Listen, I promise you, forgiveness is hard, but hate is harder. Forgiveness is hard, but bitterness is harder. Forgiveness is hard, but resentment is harder, friend. It grows and it, it'll kill you spiritually. It'll ruin your life as a Christian if you don't get that thing out of there and forgive that. It, listen, we are imperfect people and we're living in an imperfect world. And I'm sure that I, have, I, I know I have. I've done things that I had to ask forgiveness for. And there's going to be times in your life when you're going to do something that you're going to have to ask forgiveness for. So learn to forgive. I'll tell you this quote by Lewis Smeads. It's rather lengthy, but I, I like it. The miracle of forgiveness is the creation of a new beginning. It does not always take away the hurt. It does not deny the past in injury. It merely refuses to let them stand in the way of a new start. So, help us to forgive. Now, I want to look at one more thing quickly in just a moment. What we've seen here is Joseph's ability to forgive. Now what we want to look at, look in chapter 50 for just a minute. In chapter number 50, we saw Joseph's side of this forgiveness. Now let's look at his brother's side of this forgiveness. <clears throat> It's one thing, it's one thing to forgive someone when they're wrong. It's another thing to accept forgiveness when you're wrong. Joseph's brethren were wrong in every, every sense of the word and guilty in every, every sense of the word. They, they, they deserved everything that could have been given them. And yet Joseph forgave them. But what we're going to see here. And these verses of scripture that we're going to read is that forgiveness must be accepted. In chapter 49 of the book of Genesis, Jacob dies. They, in chapter 46, they make their way to Egypt. And uh, Jacob is in Egypt 17 years before he dies. So we know that it's been at least 17 years since Joseph forgave his brethren. And Jacob, Jacob dies at the end of verse number of, of chapter 49. In chapter 50, they have his burial. And I want you to look at verse 15, Genesis chapter 50, verse number 15. The Bible says, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, so shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. 
And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. Here, it's been, it's been 17 years, at least maybe longer, Joseph has forgiven his brethren. And in those 17 years, he, he, has got, he has provided them with jobs. He's provided them with food. He's provided them with a place to live. He's taken care of their families. He's done everything you can think of to help them and to be good to them. And as soon as their father dies, they come up with this story. They, they concoct this idea that, that their father said that Joseph would turn against them now. And so they, and they tell this to Joseph and he weeps about it. You know why? Because he offered them forgiveness. He forgave them completely. And we're 17 years plus down the road and they've never accepted this forgiveness. They're still carrying this load of guilt. They're still carrying this burden. They're still carrying this sin in their life when it's already been forgiven. Leads to some questions. If somebody has forgiven you, have you accepted their forgiveness? Several situations you could think about, I could think about. We've had to beg forgiveness and ask for forgiveness. And then when you're forgiven, you have to accept that. When you accept that, you have to believe that that individual meant it. And in spite of the fact that they can't forget it, they're never going to be able to forget it. That relationship has got to be mended and it's got to be restored in order for you to both to go on in harmony and agreement. So, I tell you where that happens at a lot of time. Young Christians struggle with assurance of their salvation. Can I help you for just a moment? I, and I could preach on I, I got saved in a church that believed you could lose your salvation. And I struggled with that thing for many years. And you know, some, unbelief is a sin. <laughs> Jesus said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Just believe it. He's forgiven you. Why are you carrying around and worrying about and struggling with and fighting about something that God's already forgiven you for. Trust Him and let it go. Hey man, He's, he's faithful. A lot of times as Christians we do things, say things we wish we had not have done and if we had to do over we would never do it again and we, we do what the Bible says. Jesus said in John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9, that if, if we confess our sin, He is faithful, not me. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friend, there's, there's not a one in this building tonight that is righteous. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sin, sin is not. I'm glad that we're clothed in his righteousness. But in this, in this body of flesh that we live in, we're prone to wonder. And we're going we're gonna to make mistakes and we're going to do things that we should never do. And hopefully we learn from them and won't ever do them again. But friend, we have to understand when we ask God to forgive us, he is faithful to do that. Don't keep carrying that around with you. It'll, it'll destroy your life. You'll, it'll hinder your growth as a Christian. It'll take away your joy. It'll take away your desire to tell other people about Jesus. Listen, God is faithful. He'll forgive you, friend. Yeah. When he does, accept that forgiveness. I'll say this, and I'm, I'm closing. Learn to forgive. Because if it has not already there will come a time in your life, regardless of how old or how young that you are, that you will have to beg forgiveness for somebody for something you did. When that time ever comes in my life, I want to be forgiven. So I want to forgive those who have wronged me. Amen.